So first off, some basic terminology. What is the web? Well, what was coined the World Wide Web is really just the worldwide network of web servers and web browsers. And a web browser is a program which will request web pages and then display them. And a web server is simply a program that serves those web pages to the web browsers which request them. The standard format for web pages is called HTML, which stands for Hypertext Markup Language. The idea of hypertext is something that came about in the 1960s, where you have a bunch of documents, and in those documents you have links, and the links take you to other documents. So it's hypertext in the sense that a link warps you from one place in the text to somewhere else. But web pages, of course, don't consist of just text and links, they can also contain images. So here, for example, is a really simple page that consists of some text and a link and also a picture. When a web browser requests a page from a web server, the standard protocol used is called HTTP, which stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And as we discussed in an earlier unit, HTTP requests and responses are almost always sent over TCP IP. The request or response data is put inside TCP segments, and those TCP segments are placed inside IP packets, which are then routed across the internet. And also, as we already discussed, the basic kind of HTTP request is called a GET request, which sends just basically a URL to a web server, and then the web server, looking at that URL, then responds back with the appropriate content. Now, the important thing to understand here is that a typical web page is made up of multiple resources, not just the resource, which is the HTML itself, because the HTML contains links, URLs, to other resources, notably images. So, for example, if I look at the New York Times web page in the Firefox browser, I have a plugin for Firefox which shows me all of the requests that are made to get that page, and as you can see, it consists of many GET requests, some of which are for the images on the page. Like, say, the big image in the center here. To get that image, the browser has to send a GET request just for that image. When I visited NewYorkTimes.com, first it sent a GET request which returned the HTML page, and then somewhere in the HTML there was a link for the image, this URL, http colon slash laugh graphics 8.nytimes.com slash images slash 2010 slash 08 slash 12 so blah 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 blah. That's the URL for this JPEG file, which again is retrieved in a separate GET request. We also discussed in the earlier unit that there's another kind of HTTP request called a POST request. And a POST request sends not just a URL, but also some data along with that URL. And what that data means is really entirely up to the web server's interpretation. So POST requests are used for all kinds of things, but the most common use is on a page when you fill out a form and hit the submit button, the data you filled in gets sent along as a POST request. Now, if you go back to the early days of the web, say about the mid-90s, you would see pages like this one. Not only is it ugly, but it's also static, meaning that nothing on the page is really interactive, and the page is exactly the same every time we visit it. Today's websites not only typically look better, but if you visit, say, the New York Times site and hit the refresh button repeatedly, you'll notice that most of the times you hit refresh, the page is not exactly the same. It keeps changing. What's going on there is not that someone is manually editing the front page HTML. Rather, the web server at the New York Times has server-side logic. It has custom code for the New York Times site, which, when it gets a request, it then actually generates the page which it's going to respond with. And the way this usually works is someone authored a fixed template for the New York Times site into which the web server will plug all of these elements and move them around. So at the New York Times, some reporter files a story, that story gets entered into a database, and then the web server uses that database, it pulls stories from that database, to assemble the front page. So because of server-side programming like this, most websites you visit today are dynamic. They don't constantly serve up exactly the same page for every time you send the same request. They send back different responses. There are exceptions, of course. Some sites you might still visit today will have some totally static pages, but server-side generated pages have been the norm since the late 90s. Now, the reason that web pages typically look better today than they did in the early days is not just because designers have gotten more competent, it's because the web browser itself 
uh, has become more capable. Over the years, web browsers have added features that allow authors to create more dynamic, more interesting pages. The biggest two features added to this end are what are called CSS and JavaScript. CSS, short for Cascading Style Sheets, is a mechanism that allows page authors more control over the layout of the page and the formatting. That is precisely how everything on the page is arranged and how it looks. And the second big feature added in the late 90s is JavaScript. Browsers now include a JavaScript interpreter such that you can put JavaScript code in your HTML and the browser will execute that JavaScript code. And there's a JavaScript API within the browser that allows the JavaScript code to manipulate elements of the page. So to be clear, before the inclusion of JavaScript, pages were entirely generated on the server side and what the browser got was this totally static thing. So before JavaScript, the only sense in which websites were interactive is that the user could click links and each link they clicked would take them to a new page. But now today, if you visit a site that uses JavaScript, you may click on something and find that it doesn't take you to a whole new page. You just immediately see something on the page change, like maybe a menu pops up. For a good example of something that's possible with JavaScript that wasn't possible before, just look at Google Maps. On Google Maps, you can click and drag the map to pan it around. That panning of the map is being done by JavaScript code running in your browser. And that's a very important thing to understand. On the server side of a typical website, as I mentioned, you'll have code which is generating the pages as the HTTP requests come in, but whatever JavaScript code gets sent to your browser runs in your browser on your computer, not on the server. When JavaScript was first introduced into the browsers, there was no mechanism by which in your JavaScript code you can get more data from the server. But at some point about 2000-2001, Microsoft added to their browser, Internet Explorer, they added a feature that allowed JavaScript code to make an HTTP request and then use that data within the page. So to be clear, normally when you click a link in the web page, that triggers an HTTP request, and then what you get back as the response, that's a whole new page. And so you'll see the browser, uh, the current page sort of goes white for a moment, and then uh, the, the new page fills in. In contrast, when JavaScript code on a web page makes an HTTP request, you don't see the whole page disappear, and then a new page appears. You don't see that whole page refresh. So what might happen these days is you click on something like, say, a link, but that link has been uh, turned into a special link by the JavaScript code such that it triggers a request for new data from the server, and then once that data comes back from the server, it then just gets inserted by the JavaScript code into the page. And in some cases, this can happen fast enough that you hardly notice any delay whatsoever. So this feature turned out to be so useful that it was adopted by all the browsers and in the period about 2000 to 2005, you started to see it being used more and more frequently. In fact, it became so popular, a term was coined, AJAX, which stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML, meaning you use JavaScript to make an asynchronous request, and the data usually would come back in the format of XML. Though, it doesn't have to be XML, there are other data formats. Now, even before the introduction of JavaScript, web pages didn't necessarily have to be entirely static because there were a number of what are called browser plugins. A plugin is just some extra code added into your browser, enabling some new feature for web pages that otherwise uh, web pages don't have. The most successful browser plugin to date is known as Flash, and it was created by Macromedia which subsequently has been bought by Adobe, so today it's known as Adobe Flash. What the Flash plugin does is allow your browser to display Flash content, which is not HTML, but this whole specific language just for Flash. And Flash took off because it allows for interactive graphics and audio that you just otherwise can't do in a plain web page with just HTML because HTML was just not designed for that sort of purpose. It was just meant to be a bunch of static documents that link to each other. So in any case, Flash is an example of a particularly successful browser plugin. I believe something like over 95% of all web browsers have Flash installed in their browser. 
A less popular plugin is Microsoft's Silverlight plugin, which is very much like Flash. Basically, it's another code interpreter that allows uh, code written for Silverlight to run within your page and display uh, complicated graphics and audio. Again, it's not quite as successful, whereas over 90% of users have Flash installed in their browser. Only about half of all users have Silverlight installed in their browser. It is used on a few popular sites like, say, Netflix Instant Streaming. The video is delivered via uh, Microsoft Silverlight. That's sort of the exception, though. Today, the vast majority of sites with video are delivering the video and displaying it via the Flash plugin. So YouTube, for example, the video there is delivered in Flash. And you can almost always tell which parts of a web page are done in Flash because they'll be in their own little box where if you right click there, you won't get the normal context menu. Instead, you'll get a context menu where at the bottom it says about Adobe Flash Player. So here, for example, most of what we're looking at is just straight HTML but then that portion with the video, that box area, that's the flash element being displayed on the page. Before we get into the details of HTML, you may be confused about the different versions of HTML. For example, you may have heard of what's called XHTML. What's the difference versus regular HTML? Well, the X just stands for XML, and XML, if you're not familiar, it stands for Extensible Markup Language. It's a generic syntax for markup languages. And while original HTML superficially resembles XML, there are in fact some subtle differences, and XHTML was an attempt to get HTML to conform to the XML standard, as well as clean up a few other loose ends. Well, this whole XHTML initiative wasn't terribly successful, while all of the browsers support the XHTML version of HTML, a large majority of websites out there seem to have just ignored it, so in that sense it's failed. For our purposes, we're just going to ignore XHTML. There's not much to it. If you want to read up on it, it won't take you very long. Now, you may have also heard of HTML5, which is HTML version 5, the latest and greatest version, which replaces version 4, the version we've had for almost 15 years now. HTML5 is a really quite exciting development because it's adding to HTML, standard HTML, a whole bunch of features which otherwise we've had to rely upon plugins like Flash and Silverlight for, like say video. There's now a video tag in HTML5, which when the browsers all support it, that will allow websites to deliver video in a way that doesn't rely upon any plugin. So video is one example of what's new in HTML5, there's a whole bunch of other things. Uh, if you want to read into it, I suggest you go to dive into mark5.info. That's a site that has a whole bunch of uh, introductory stuff about HTML5. What we are going to discuss in this unit are just the classic features of HTML, the standard stuff that's been around for a long time. The code of an HTML document is composed of tags which have this form. It starts with an opening tag in angle brackets and ends in a closing tag in angle brackets. And in between, you may optionally have what is called content. Inside the angle brackets of the opening and closing tags, you have the name of the tag itself, that is, the identifier of which tag is this. In HTML, there are about a hundred different types of tags, for example, one called div, D-I-V. So in a div tag, where here we have written tag in italics, you would place that with div, both in the opening tag and the closing tag. Now, in the closing tag, you will notice after the first angle bracket, there is a slash. That is what distinguishes the closing tag from the opening tag. And then in the opening tag, after the name of the tag itself, you may optionally have one or more attributes. Attributes are name value pairs written like so, where there's the name of the attribute, then an equal sign, and then in quotation marks, the value for that attribute. Tag attributes function basically like options, like parameters for that tag. Which attributes a tag takes depends upon the type of the tag. Some tags have multiple attributes, some have none. In some cases they're optional, sometimes they're required. If you do give a tag multiple attributes, it doesn't matter what order you write them in. You can write attributes in any order. So, here's an example tag. HTML has a tag called A, standing for anchor, which strangely is what HTML calls a hyperlink, uh, 
So this tag is creating a link. You'll notice here that the name of the tag, A, is written both in the opening tag and the closing tag. In between, we have some content, which is just some text reading, do you like ducks? And then in the opening tag, there's one attribute, href, with a URL for its value reading http colon slash slash en.wikipedia.org slash wiki slash duck. So this tag creates a hyperlink that reads, do you like ducks? But when the user clicks on do you like ducks, it takes them to the URL wikipedia.org slash wiki slash duck. href, by the way, just stands for hypertext reference. It's a bit of a strange name, but that's what they chose. So this is a complete example of a tag. An important thing to keep in mind again, though, is that what the attributes are and what they mean, and also what the content is and what it means, that depends entirely upon which type of tag. So this is an A tag, an anchor tag, and so what you put in the content, that's what you're actually going to see as the link that's highlighted in blue and, you, and underlined and you click on it. And when you click on it, it takes you to whatever's specified in the href attribute. Those are the semantics specific to the anchor tag. Other tags have totally different meaning for their content or for their attributes. And others, as I said, don't necessarily have any attributes and some of them don't take any content. There are some tags where you can't include content at all. And in fact, for those tags, there is a special form that is preferred where you don't write both an opening tag and a closing tag, you just write one tag where the slash comes at the end after the attributes. For example, the IMG tag, the image tag, you don't put any content in an image tag, so you should write it in this form with just a slash at the end. So here is a complete image tag, and the image tag has one required attribute, a source attribute, source written SRC, and the value of the source attribute is the URL pointing to the image file we want to display. Now, for those tags which may include content, most of them allow you to include not just text, but also other tags. So here, for example, is an anchor tag, an A tag, uh, basically a hyperlink, and the content here is no longer just the text, do you like ducks? We've also thrown in an image tag. So this hyperlink will consist of not just the text, but also an image. And you'll be able to click on that image, and it'll be just like clicking on the text. It'll take you to the same page. I did mention that HTML has somewhere like around 100 different tags. However, many of those tags have since been deprecated, meaning that they were originally created with some purpose in mind and people re later realized that, hey, they're not terribly useful or they're just a bad idea. So people shouldn't be using them anymore. And in fact, in practice anyway, there's only about, say, I don't know, 30, 40 tags which are used the vast majority of the time. And then the rest are used very, very rarely or almost not at all. Furthermore, not only are many tags either ignored or deprecated, the same is true of attributes. Many of the common tags we use have one or more attributes which were useful in the early days but since have been superseded. Mainly this is because of CSS. CSS wasn't originally around when HTML was first introduced and over the years CSS has added more and more features that have made a lot of the old stuff, the old tag attributes, redundant. So we're certainly not going to cover the entirety of HTML. We're not going to go over the whole reference. And you should also keep in mind, if you ever do look at an HTML reference, there's a lot of stuff there that uh, it's either going to be explicitly labeled as deprecated, or you'll just find that the best practice is to use the new CSS stuff wherever possible. In any case, tags pretty much encompass the entire syntax of HTML, though there is one more thing, and that is character entity references. A character entity reference is basically just the HTML equivalent of an escape sequence. And these simply allow you to include in the content of a tag characters which you otherwise couldn't. So for example, the less than and greater than symbols. Those are used especially to de denote the uh, opening and closing tags of any tag. So we need some special way to denote them in content. And the way we write these character entity references is we simply start with an ampersand and end with a semicolon, and the text in between specifies which character entity reference this is. So for example, if in the content of a tag you wish to write itchy ampersand scratchy greater than Tom and Jerry, then you have to write itchy ampersand amp semicolon scratchy 
ampersand gt semicolon tom ampersand amp semicolon jerry those three are certainly the most common character entity references you'll see except maybe nbsp which stands for non-breaking space which is generally used sort of as a as a cheat as a kludge for including an extra space in your text what i haven't yet mentioned is that when you write text content in an html tag the white space in the content gets collapsed into single spaces so wherever you have a white space character other than space like you have a new line character that just gets translated into a single space and wherever you have multiple white space characters next to each other they just get collapsed down into a single space while this works out well most of the time it is annoying when you want to genuinely have multiple spaces between words and the cheat that lets you get around this is to just insert some non-breaking space character entity references. The thing to keep in mind though is that it's called a non-breaking space for a reason. It's not just a space. What non-breaking means here is that two words split by a non-breaking space won't be used as a junction point for starting the next line. Normally when you write two words separated by a space, uh, if that's the near the end of the line, then the second word might get split down to the next line. Well, with a non-breaking space, that doesn't happen. So keep that difference in mind, and also understand that most experienced web designers consider the use of non-breaking spaces to be sort of a kludge. It's never the right solution. If you find yourself relying upon non-breaking spaces, you're probably doing something the wrong way. There's probably a better way of doing it. I wouldn't fret too much about it, though. In any case, moving on, here is a complete example of an HTML document. A proper HTML document always consists of a single HTML tag inside which are two other tags, first the head tag for the header and the body tag in which go all the tags which you actually see displayed in the page. The tags which go in the header, in contrast, are just things which aren't actually displayed in the page, like for example the title of your HTML document. When you go to a web page you'll notice that usually you'll see a little title on the tab and that's where this comes from the title tag inside the head tag inside the html tag so if we were to view this html document in our web browser the tab in the browser would read example web page you can also see here an html comment here displayed in green html comments are written in angle brackets with an exclamation mark and two hyphens immediately after and then you have the text of the comment which can be whatever and then at the end you have again two hyphens before the closing angle bracket. So just like in a programming language, everything in a comment is ignored. The other thing to watch out here is that just like with the multi-line comments in C syntax in Java in JavaScript, the, the slash asterisk asterisk slash, those multi-line comments you can't nest them, remember? You can't put one inside the other, otherwise that screws up the uh, the, the parser misinterprets that. And the same thing happens in HTML. So you can't put an HTML comment inside another HTML comment, otherwise you can have all this text which actually isn't commented out and gets interpreted as like it's supposed to be a tag, which will probably lead to all sorts of strange behavior. So just be careful not to put comments inside other comments. Now you'll notice for easy readability I have indented things such that the HTML tag is up against the margin and then all the tags contained within I have indented by one and then within those tags like say the title tag I have that indented by a, a, another level. While this style of indentation creates very neat looking HTML that's easy to scan and read the problem is that the nature of HTML is you tend to end up with some tags that are deeply nested they're like 10 or 12 levels in so you would have to end up scrolling left and right a lot if you were to browse up and down an HTML document. So unlike in code, most practitioners don't strictly indent all of their HTML. They don't have everything properly indented. The rule that carries the day in HTML is just when it comes to indentation, do what you feel like, basically. And also be clear that the syntax of HTML is free form, so in fact we could put our entire HTML document just on one line. Uh, we don't have to strictly separate the closing tags onto their own lines. Putting everything on one line though of course would be quite ugly and bad practice, so I wouldn't recommend that. 
In any case, here's the same HTML document just shoved up against the left margin. And now what if we actually put stuff in that body so that we have a real page? Well, now in the body we have some content, we have some text content and some tags. First there's the text hello there with an exclamation mark, and then an anchor tag with its own content followed by an image. So if we open this HTML document in our browser, this is what we should see. Uh, assuming, of course, that the link to the image I have here is still available and still is the same picture. What we end up with is a very simple page, and notice how things are laid out here just from left to right. We'll talk more later about arranging elements on the page. Looking now, though, at a much more complicated example here, the New York Times front page, if in your web browser you hit Control u that should bring up the source from the page, that is, the HTML, which your browser retrieved from the web server and then interpreted to display the page. So for this example, I can't fit the entirety of the document in one screen, but just looking at the top, you'll notice it starts with the HTML tag, and then first immediately after that, we're starting the head tag, which then gets closed later down the page, as you see, um, and immediately after that starts the body, which is closed somewhere below that we can't see here, and after that is the closing HTML tag. Don't fret if you think it looks complicated. There's really nothing all that complicated going on here. There's just a lot of it. Also note that up at the very top, before even the HTML tag, there's something that looks like a tag, but which actually isn't. It's the doc type, uh, written with a uh, opening angle bracket, then a exclamation mark, and the word doc type. Uh, what the doc type does is it's just specifying which version of HTML this is. A doc type is actually an idea borrowed from XML. It's just specifying which version of HTML exactly this is. Be clear that pages don't have to have a doc type. Most browsers are usually pretty good about guessing which version of HTML exactly you are using just by, they just infer from what tags you have and so forth. If you do include one though, I believe actually best practice now is to just include one that reads doc type HTML and that's it. Nothing else. Not, none of that junk that says public and all that stuff in quotation marks. You don't need any of that. Now let's look at a few more of the essential tags. The tags h1, h2, h3, h4, h5, and h6 are all header tags, and the difference between them is they're just different levels of header. And header in this context is not the same as the head of the document itself, but Within a document, you have different sections, and you announce those sections with a header. So think like a typical, say, academic paper. You have different sections, and they each have their own header. So H1 is the top-level header. It's sort of like the title at the top of the paper. And then for subsections therein, you announce them with a second-level header, an H2 tag. And then for subsections within those sections, you would use a third-level header, an H3 tag, to announce those subsections, and so forth. And then for the actual meat of your text, the actual paragraphs that make up those sections, you use the paragraph tag, the P tag. So in our example here, we have a document with three paragraphs, and also a first-level header and a second-level header. And notice that the real practical difference of these tags is basically just the size of the text. So H1 tags are the biggest, uh, H2 are somewhat smaller, and H3 tag is going to be somewhat smaller than that, and so on down the line, to H6 being the smallest, and then paragraph tags have the smallest text of all. Also note here that adjacent paragraph tags and adjacent header tags uh, have some vertical space in between them. Now, keep in mind that the primary intent of these tags is not to impose style, that is, not to produce an end visual effect, in your document of this text is bigger than that text, the real point is to let you structure your document in a logical fashion where your headers are placed in header tags and the meat of your text is placed in paragraph tags. And while these tags do have different visual effects, that's all just style. And as we'll see later, style is something that you can actually modify with CSS. So, for example, if you want your H1 tags to be bigger, or to be smaller, or to be in bold, or to be a different color, or if you want your paragraphs to be noted by indentation of the first line rather than separated by vertical space, these are things you can do in CSS. You can modify the default behavior and appearance of these tags.
So we'll get to CSS in a bit, but keep in mind that when it comes to writing your documents, you should think first in terms of logical structure, and that's how you should choose your tags. And then if you don't like the default look given to those tags, well, you can change it in CSS. The OL tag is short for ordered list, as in a list in which the order of the items is significant, such that generally you want them numbered from one down to however many things you have. And inside the order list tag, you include LI tags, LI here standing for list item. And so each LI tag uh, constitutes another item of the ordered list. So as you can see here, the default style of presentation for an ordered list is that each list item starts with a number with a dot after it, um, starting from one down to however many list items you have. The UL tag standing for unordered list works uh, very much the same. It's just for a list where the order of the items is not significant, so they're just presented with bullets rather than numbers. The table tag is intended for the presentation of tabular data, that is, data presented like a spreadsheet with a bunch of rows and columns. Inside the table tag, for each row you place a TR tag, TR standing for table row, and then in each TR tag you place any number of TD tags, TD standing for table data, and these TD tags are the cells that make up the table. So in this example here, we have two table rows, two TR tags, and in the first row, we have two TDs, two table, table data tags, so there's two cells there, but then in the second row, we have three. So the table ends up being a two by three table just that in the first row, the last cell is empty because the second row had one more uh, TD tag. And also note here that the default presentation is to simply have the items arranged in a neat grid with no vertical or horizontal lines separating them and no border around the table. But there are attributes that allow us to add in such things and also there are actually CSS properties that uh, also allow greater control over the borders and the, uh, the divisor lines between the different cells. And also allows for control of the positioning within the cells and the padding within the cells and, and so forth. The div tag is one of the most important tags. Div here stands for either divider or div divisor or division. I'm not certain which, I would probably say division. Any case, a div tag is a generic rectangular container for text content and other tags. It's actually almost exactly like a paragraph tag, except that paragraph tags have the, the default behavior where adjacent paragraph tags and paragraphs adjacent to headers uh, have vertical space between them, where as you see here, that's not the case. We have these two divs, one immediately after the other, and the second div and the first div aren't separated by extra vertical space, which would not be the case if these were paragraph tags, if they were p tags. So as you'll see when we get into CSS, you'll find that uh, most page layouts are designed by breaking them down into a bunch of divs and divs within divs. And then using the CSS, uh, we position the divs, we set their widths, their heights, their positions relative to each other, and so forth. So again, the div tag is a generic rectangular container for content, for text and other tags. But there's another generic container tag called span, except span is not used to contain rectangles. It doesn't form a rectangle. It's used to contain any amount of text, uh, even text that flows across different lines, you know, that gets broken up into multiple lines. So here, for example, in this div tag, we have a bunch of text content, and I can take any of this text content, this inline content, as it's called, and place it inside a span tag. And while that in itself doesn't do anything, it will not change anything here, putting a you don't stop in the span tag. But what it allows us to do, we'll see, is with CSS, then apply style just to the text within that span. So if I want just this text within the div to say be bright red, uh, 
I put it in a span and then using CSS make the text in that span bright red and the rest of the text in the div would be unaffected. So now let's look at CSS cascading style sheets. And you may have noticed when we covered all of those essential tags that I didn't make mention of any attributes because, well, it turns out that the large majority of things that used to be accomplished with attributes in HTML tags is now accomplished by using CSS. CSS is all about applying properties, aka styles, to the elements of the page. And these properties are things like positioning elements, sizing them, uh, sizing the text, changing the font, the font style, whether it's italicized or bold and so forth, changing the color of the text, applying borders to elements, giving things background colors or background images, and a few other things, though that mainly covers it. In total, there are somewhere around 100 different CSS properties, though in practice we stick to using most commonly about 30 so. When we express a property, we write it as name colon value semicolon. So here, for example, here are two properties. First, font hyphen weight colon bold. That means uh, make the font bold for whatever element this is being applied to. And then border hyphen width with 5px, 5px meaning 5 pixels. That means give the element a border which is 5 pixels wide. So you'll note here in the case of our first property, the font weight property, the value is expressed as basically just a fixed word. There's like three or different uh, possible values for font weight. There's normal, there's bold, and uh, I forget what else, but those are the primary ones. And then for other properties like border width, it's expressed as a unit of measurement. So there are a few standard units of measurement st used in CSS. When it comes to font sizes, you'll see PT as in font point size, and you'll also see EM, which is, uh, the M measurement is something that uh, comes from typography, from typesetting. Um, and it's something to do with the, the height of a lowercase m or something like that. Anyway, it's a different measurement of, of font size. Uh, and then also you'll see measurements in terms of pixels for things like widths and heights. And that is just written as PX, so you'll see five p PX here means five pixels. And then other times you'll see things measured in terms of percentages. Um, so if something takes is given a width of 70%, that means that you, you want it to take up 70% of whatever it is, whatever other element is contained within or something like that. So that's just written with a percent sign. And then when it comes to expressing colors, um, you can specify the precise color using hex. And there's actually two forms. You can use three hex digits, or you can use uh, six hex digits. When you see number sign FFF, that's a color signifying white, because the first digit is the red component, the second digit is the uh, green component, and then the third digit is the blue component. And they're all set to F, meaning the, the brightest value, rather than th the darkest, so F um, if you turn up the red, green, and blue all the way, that means you get white, right? Uh, zero, zero, zero would be black, total black. And the second example here, number sign followed by six hex digits. Well, the, the first two digits are the red, the second two digits are the blue, uh, sorry, green, and then the third di two digits, the last two digits, are the blue. So this means uh, the red is... There's no red, there's no green, and blue is set to E9. So this is some shade of blue. Uh, basically, the, the difference between the three-digit form and the six-digit form is just how precise do you want to be. Obviously, the, the six-digit form allows for more precision. And then finally, you also see colors expressed sometimes as just words. Uh, there's a fixed number of words, I think like 100 different uh, shades of color expressed as words like there's red, there's light red, there's green, light blue, and, and some other number. There's there's a list you can look up of CSS colors that uh, tells you what, what color names are available. So those are examples of what CSS properties look like, but how do you specify which element a property is being applied to? And one way, the simplest and most direct way, is to simply give that element 
an attribute called style and then in the quotation marks of that attribute uh, just write the property or the list out the properties that you want so in this case we have our div and we're applying the style font hyphen weight with the value bold and we just happen to have one property in there but we can actually list as many as we like and so because of the style attribute this div will be presented with the text in bold now for text properties things like font weight font size uh, font style etc font color those get inherited by the elements within an element so here we have this span contained within a div and the div has the bold style applied to it so the span within that div is going to inherit that same property so the the text in the span is going to be bold as well if we want to change this we have to apply a contradictory style to the span itself so here we give it a style attribute with the value font hyphen weight colon normal so it's no longer bold it's just normal Again, be clear that this inheritance behavior only applies to text properties. It doesn't apply to other properties, uh, like, say, for borders or positioning elements. So directly applying styles with the style attribute is one way to do it, but it's actually the, the, the way that's most frowned upon. You're really not supposed to do things that way. It's considered bad practice. Uh, alternatively, uh, the much better thing to do is to apply styles to elements using what are called rules and these rules you write inside a style tag which you place in the header of your document and notice here that the style tag should have a type attribute with the value text slash css i believe actually most browsers will work fine if you just omit that attribute uh, but it's it's good practice because it's supposed to be there at least the standard says it's supposed to be there because in theory we could have different kinds of styles other than CSS. In practice, so CSS are the only kinds of styles uh, supported by the browsers. So it's kind of strange that we have to specify that, hey, this is CSS and not something else, because there isn't anything else other than CSS, at least as of yet. In any case, I would recommend you always write type equals text slash CSS. Anyway, so how do you write these rules? Well, a CSS rule has the form selector or selectors multiple selectors followed by a pair of curly braces inside which you list one or more properties so the selector or selectors as you can probably imagine is the part which specifies which elements we're going to apply these properties to and then the properties are the properties which we're applying to those elements there are actually about a dozen different kinds of selectors though there are just a few that we use most commonly the simplest kind of selector is surely one that just specifies the name of a tag, which simply means to apply these properties to all tags of this type. So here we have a rule with the selector div and two properties. So these two properties, uh, font weight bold and border width four pixels, will be applied to all div tags. So that's surely the simplest kind of selector, but it's rather kind of ham-fisted because how often do you want to apply a style to every single element of one particular type usually you want to single out specific uh, elements so for that purpose we can give elements what are called ids and classes here we have a div and by its attributes we are giving it the id poem and we're giving it two classes apple and banana the idea of an id is that it is totally unique just for that element so if an element has an id it only has one and the id which it has should be totally unique to that element no other element here should have an id that's also poem a class on the other hand is meant to identify potentially multiple items so we can have a bunch of different elements all with the same class and a single element can have multiple classes as the div here does also understand that when we write the classes in the class attribute, it doesn't matter which order we list them in. So we could have written banana space apple, and it would have meant the same thing. So once we've used attributes to give elements IDs and or classes, we can then specify them in our selectors. And we specify an ID in a selector by writing number sign followed by the name of the ID, 
So this rule here means that the element with the ID poem should have the properties font weight, bold, and border width 4 pixels. And we specify a class in a selector by writing dot, then the name of the class. So here the class banana, all elements of that class are given the two properties font weight bold and border width 4 pixel. So ID selectors and class selectors are by far the most common selectors you're going to use. Uh, but things can get a little bit more interesting. We can write, say, here div.banana, and that means that all divs that are members of the class banana, they are given these two properties. So here, if in our document we happen to have an element which is a member of the class banana, but which is not a div, then this rule will not apply. Now, when we throw a bunch of CSS rules into our document, the possibility arises that there might be some sort of conflict. There might be contradictory styles being applied to the same element. So the question is, how does the browser resolve these conflicts? Well, the rule is simply this. First off, if the style attribute is being applied, then the properties specified in that style attribute, they always take precedence. So if in the style attribute I make something bold, and then in some other CSS rule I make it not bold, something other than bold, uh, the style attribute is going to win out, and that thing is going to be bold. Do keep in mind, I told you already, that using the style attribute is not considered good practice. It's something you're supposed to avoid, but do understand that it always takes precedence. But aside from the style attribute, when it comes to choosing between different rules, uh, the order of precedence is simply that the thing, the selector with the most IDs, takes precedence over the selector with the most classes, and then that takes precedence over the selector with the most tag names. And finally, if there's a tie, then the browser just uses whichever rule it read last. So the order in which you write your rules can be significant. Generally, though, I would say you should try and avoid how things come down to a tiebreaker based on uh, the order in which you write your rules. It's just something which is a, a bit too subtle, and you're going to start confusing yourself when your document gets complicated. In any case, consider an example. Here we have two separate rules, one with the selector div.apple and one with the selector id of limerick. And both of these rules contain a border width property. Uh, one specifying a border width of 4 pixels, the other specifying a border width of 8 pixels. So, the potential arises that in the document we might have a single element which, uh, to which both of these rules apply. We might have an element which is a div, which is a member of the class Apple, but which also has the ID Limerick. And if that's the case, the question is, well, which of those two border width properties takes precedence? Is, is the border width going to be 4 pixels or 8 pixels for that element? So going by our rule, the first criteria is which of these two rules has more IDs? And the answer is that, well, only the second one, the number sign limerick, that's the only one that has an ID specified in the selector. So that's the one here that's going to take precedence. Now, if we consider a very similar example, except here, instead of uh, ID of limerick, it's the second selector specified as a class of Apple. Well, again, we have a conflict because there are going to be elements to which both of these rules apply. Any div, which is a member of the class Apple in this case. So the question again is which takes precedence? And the answer is first we look at the number of IDs. And neither of these selectors specify any IDs, so they're equal there. So the tiebreaker then is which has the most classes specified? And the answer is, well, they both have an equal number of classes specified. They just have one. The, the class Apple. And so from there, the number is which selector has the most tag names in it. And only the top one here has any tag names. It, it specifies div. So that's the one that's going to take precedence. And the elements are going to take four pixel borders, not eight. So these are the simplest, but also most essential types of selectors we use in CSS. Uh, as I mentioned, there are a few others, and we'll cover those in the supplement. So now let's look a bit more at some of the essential CSS properties. One of the most important is one called display, 
which has a number of different values, but the two most common and most important are block and inline. A number of tags, including div, p, the header tags, h1 through h6, ul, ol, those all have their display property set to block, and then the tags span, a for anchor, for hyperlinks, and image, those three tags by default have the display value inline. So we have this division between what we call block elements and inline elements. And in fact, this distinction is all that separates div tags from span tags. Div and span tags are both generic containers. They're just things to contain other tags or text content. But the only thing that makes them different is that by default, div tags have a display value of block and span tags have a display value of inline. And in fact, if you were to give a div the display value inline, it would in effect act just like a span. And vice versa, if you give a span the display value block, it would then act just like a div. So what is the significance of display block and display inline? Well, a element with display value of block is by default something which takes up the whole width of whatever it is contained within. And by default, its height is whatever is necessary to fit all of its content. Notice in both these cases, I said by default, because you can modify the width and height of a div uh, using other CSS properties. In contrast, an element which is display inline is always just as wide and tall as its content, and you cannot modify that. You cannot, with the, the CSS properties width and height, change the width or height of an inline element. Furthermore, inline elements, unlike block elements, are not necessarily rectangular. They get laid out much like text gets laid out. You know, you type in your word processor and every word you type uh, gets flowed onto the end of your line. And when it needs to wrap on to successive lines, it does so. So another way to think of it is that inline elements can share the same line. They can be adjacent to the elements which directly precede and follow them. And if necessary, the content of a span can get split across lines. To illustrate this difference, we have here a simple HTML document that contains merely two divs. Um, for convenience, I've made the background color of the first div pink and the background color of the second div light blue, so you can see the space which they both take up. And first of all, notice that both of these divs are perfectly rectangular. They take up the full width available to them, and both of these divs are included directly in the body, so they take up the width of the whole page. And the first div, you'll notice, is taller than the second, but that's just because both divs are sized to whatever is necessary to, to accommodate all of the content inside of them. If we then take this exact HTML file and just change the divs into spans, well, now the display is inline rather than block. And you can see, first off, that neither spans are rectangular. Their text content is simply flowing from one line to the next, and as soon as the end of the text is reached, well, that's the end of the span. Uh, you'll also notice there's a subtle difference where in between the lines of text, there's actually a little bit of space that's not being filled in with a background color because technically um, there's a bit of space between the lines which isn't really part of the span area. Also, very importantly, notice that the second span picks up immediately on the same line where the previous span leaves off. That's what I meant when I said that inline elements can occupy the same line as the other inline elements immediately adjacent to them. So that's the essence of the distinction between block and inline. Keep in mind there are a few other display properties. They're, they're found less commonly and used less commonly. There is one though called block hyphen inline, which is sort of a hybrid between the two. And also keep in mind that the block versus inline distinction has some subtleties I didn't really go into. Moving on, here you've seen I've taken that same example with the div tags, but I've opened the page in, a, in an extension for Firefox called Firebug, which is a very handy tool for inspecting uh, the current web page you're looking at. And it has this handy little chart here on the right for displaying the layout of an element. And what it's showing you is the sizing information for that element, including the margin, the border, and the padding. Together, these things make up what is called the CSS box model, which refers simply to how, in HTML and CSS, these boxes, these block elements mainly, are treated. 
when we say that an element has a width of 100 pixels and then a border of 5 pixels and a margin of 20 pixels, what exactly does that mean? For, does the border get counted as part of the width or is it in addition to the width or, or what? Well, the way it works is that the width and the height properties of an element apply just to the content area, that innermost box. And then any padding you add is on top of that. The border then surrounds the padding, and outside the padding is this further area called margin. The difference between margin and padding is a bit subtle. While, as I just said, margin goes outside the border and padding goes inside the border, well, a lot of times you don't have a border on your element, so it sometimes is hard to decide, wait, should I use margin or should I use padding to put space around this element? And it turns out that in different contexts, there's actually subtly different behavior between margin and padding. In particular, margin in some contexts has this behavior called margin collapsing, whereby two adjacent margins with margin areas that are touching each other, well then, those two margins can collapse into each other, where if you, one has the 20 pixel margin and another has a 10 pixel margin, you don't get a 30 pixel margin, you just get a 20 pixel margin. So there are some tricky behaviors like that to keep in mind. If I have to give a general rule though, I would say that you use margin to put distance between the block itself and adjacent items, and then use padding when you want to squeeze within that area, you want to squeeze the content into a smaller confines. It's still a pretty subtle distinction, but I find it's a, a useful rule of thumb. In any case, here's a simple illustration of these properties. Here we've taken the top div and first we've given it, given it a border of three pixels and we specified that that border is solid black, you'll note. And then for the padding, we've specified 20 pixels. So there's padding of 20 pixels all the way around between the border and the actual content. And then the margin we have specified as 30 pixels. And the subtlety to note here is that we didn't specify any width for our div. So by default, in accumulation of its margin, its border, and its padding, and its content, the width is still taking up um, only as much as is allotted to it in that, that space within the body, the, basically within the width of the page. So you can see in the little diagram Firebug gives us on the right that the width of this div is actually 792 pixels. That's the width of the content area. If we were to manually specify a width of something greater than 792 pixels, like say 800 pixels or 900 pixels, then this div, including its content, its padding, its border, and its margin, its width would exceed the width of its container, the body. So you'd actually get in our browser window here a little uh, horizontal scroll bar at the bottom because then the width of the page would actually exceed the width of the browser window. Now again, note here how I've specified the border. There's a property called border and I've given it the value 3 pixels solid black. If I just wrote three pixels, you wouldn't see any border because you have to actually specify that it's solid and that it's black. Otherwise, if you don't specify a color, and if you don't specify a style, whether it's solid or dashed or dotted or, or there's a few others, if you don't specify those things, you won't see any border. Now, like many things in CSS, there's actually different ways of expressing the same thing. Like say, the border here, I can specify the color not as a color name, but, as, but in hex. I can write uh, either uh, number sign 000 or number sign 000000, either the three digit form or the six digit hex form. And additionally, you can actually also specify these border properties independently with three different properties. You can use border hyphen width, border hyphen style, or and border hyphen color. And this is convenient because imagine, say, we've applied to a whole bunch of elements by some CSS rule, we've applied a border of two pixels solid black, but then there's this one item, this one element, where we just want to change the color, and just the color. We don't want to change the width of the style. Well, then we can apply to that element just the border hyphen color property. And somewhat similarly, when it comes to specifying paddings or margins, you can write the padding as we did with just a single width value, a single number, meaning the same padding on all four sides, or you can alternatively write out four different numbers to specify the top, the right, the bottom, and the left in that order. So we can give the four different sides different amounts of padding. And alternatively, if you write just two numbers, then that's interpreted as first being the top and the bottom, and then the right and the left.
And once again, for convenience, sometimes you just want to on an element specify just its left padding or its right padding or its bottom or its top. So you can actually specify them with four separate properties. You can write just padding hyphen left to specify just the left or padding hyphen right to specify just the right and so forth. And the margin property works just the same way. If you specify just one number for the property margin, then that means it's the margin all the way around, but you can write it as four separate numbers or just two separate numbers between top and bottom and right and left, or you can use the margin hyphen left property, the margin hyphen right property, etc. And finally, actually with borders, you can also specify different widths on all four sides and actually different colors and different styles on all four sides. So you can specify a property of, say, border hyphen left hyphen color to specify just the color on the left side, and so forth. By the way, if you're like me, you'll find that it takes you a long time to remember that the four numbers are written first in order of top, right, bottom, left. Uh, the, the, the quick way to think of that is that it's clockwise, starting from, from 12 o'clock. Top, right, bottom, left goes from 12, 3 o'clock, 6, 9 o'clock. So these few properties we've discussed, display, margin, padding, border, width, height, and a few others we haven't discussed, position, z-index, float, clear, overflow, clip. These are the primary properties we use to lay out our pages, to arrange all the elements into proper sizes and proper positions. I'm not going to go over here, position, z-index, float, clear, overflow, clip, and I'm not going to go into some of the more subtleties of the ones we've already covered either. If you really want to understand CSS layout, and you're going to want to understand it if you're not going to get frustrated making your web pages, then you should read a couple books. In particular, there's one called, uh, there's an O'Reilly book called HTML and CSS. The good parts, that is probably the best uh, place to start. And also, uh, CSS, the missing manual is pretty good too. Once you read those books, you'll understand better why HTML and CSS are structured the way they are. You'll get a bit of the history and understand why best practice says to do certain things one way and not the other. For example, they'll give you some insight into the debate between what's called CSS layout and table layout. CSS layout is to do the layout of your pages using CSS properties, uh, mainly the ones I just listed. Whereas in contrast, what's called table layout is the old way of doing things where you would primarily position things on your page by putting things into table tags even though tables weren't really designed for this purpose. Tables originally were for uh, displaying tabular data in two-dimensional grids. But because in those early days, back in the 90s, CSS actually wasn't a reality. It wasn't introduced into browsers at all until the end of 1996. And for many years, it just didn't have a lot of the features or work properly in real-world browsers the way it was supposed to. So out of necessity, web designers would abuse the table tag to arrange their elements into the proper positions. And even as CSS got better over the years, as the browsers started implementing it properly, for many, many years, people still would insist on using table layout rather than CSS layout. Because, as I've sort of hinted at, there are certain things in CSS layout that are kind of hard. It, it can be kind of tricky sometimes to get, for example, two divs to exist side by side, for example. So because of those frustrations, and also because people just went with what they knew for many years, people would stick with table layouts. In any case, if you want to read up on this debate, there's one link here I have that's in support of CSS layouts, and then there's this other uh, contrary view in support of table layouts. So some people, a few people, still insist on saying that table layouts are a good or at least acceptable way of doing layouts still today, though I would say that's certainly the minority view now. A large majority of web designers, I would say, have moved on now to doing everything as much as possible in CSS without falling back on using tables. We've already covered all of the essential tags that you're going to put into the content of your web pages, that is, in the bodies, but here are four more that are pretty essential to know, except these all go in the header. First, there's style, which we've already covered, which is really just about including CSS rules. And then there's the script tag, which is for including JavaScript code. And there's the link tag, which is for linking in related resources, uh, which is sort of a generic catch-all. Uh, we'll discuss in a moment. 
and meta meta tags are simply meta information about the page. The most common use of the meta tag is to throw in extra information in the page so that search engines like Google can see what the keywords of the page are. For example, looking back at the source code of the New York Times page we saw, you'll see in the first half of the header here there's a good number of meta tags, including one with attribute name equals keywords and an attribute content equals politics and government, Manhattan, Christians and Christianity, Muslim Americans, Tea Party movement, demonstrations, etc., etc., etc. Those are all just keywords which are intended for search engines like Google. So when Google crawls the New York Times website and encounters this page, it can get some idea of what this page concerns. That, anyway, is the most common use of meta tags. There are a few other uses we won't get into. The most common use of the link tag is to link in style sheets, that is, files of CSS rules, because you can include CSS rules, as I showed you already, with the style tag put inside the header of your page, but more commonly, if you have a whole bunch of CSS, you're going to split that off into some separate file, which you would probably name something like site.css, and you'd place it somewhere on your web server, and then using the link tag, link to it, so that when your web page is downloaded, the user's web browser also knows to request this file of CSS rules, which it then applies to the same page. So here in this example, the link tag has an attribute rel, which stands for relationship, as in the relationship, what kind of relationship this linked resource has to the page in which the link tag is included. In this case, the linked resource is a style sheet. And then the type specifies, again, that this is CSS and href, uh, again, hypertext reference. That's simply the URL of the resource, in this case, the file of CSS rules. Now, you may object here that this URL, site.css, doesn't look like a normal URL. Well, what's going on here is that this is a relative URL rather than an absolute URL. An absolute URL, like an absolute file path, is fully written out, like we expect. But a relative URL, like a relative file path, is incomplete, and the full URL, the absolute URL, is uh, inferred from context. And the way that works is when you see a relative URL in a web page, like say in a link tag, the browser takes the absolute URL of the page itself, hacks off the part after the last slash, and then appends the relative URL. So, for example, if our browser downloads the page example.com slash stuff slash junk slash thing.html, and in that page there's a relative URL that just reads site.css, then the way the browser interprets that is as a URL pointing to example example.com slash stuff slash junk slash site.css. Now the thing to keep in mind here is that though URLs superficially resemble file paths, they really aren't because on the web server here there's not necessarily any directory called stuff inside which is any directory called junk. There's no necessary requirement for that to be the case at all. You know, what the URL means is entirely up to interpretation by the web server. However, it's very common in websites to somewhat imitate that directory structure when it comes to designing the structure of URLs for the site. So relative URLs are often quite useful. And in fact, you can also use dot dot in your relative URLs, and it works very much like with relative file paths. So if we're on the page example.com slash stuff slash junk slash thing dot html and we have a relative URL on that page that reads dot dot slash site dot CSS, then the browser interprets that as not hacking off everything after the last slash, but hacking off everything um, after the second to last slash. So we end up with example.com slash stuff slash site dot CSS. Again, this is a superficial imitation of relative file paths and absolute file paths, but just remember that the similarities end there. A form in a web page refers to any combination of text boxes, check boxes, radio buttons, uh, pull down menus, etc. The idea of web forms is that the user is prompted to fill out certain information, like fill in text boxes. And once they've done so, they then hit the Submit button. That Submit button is like a link to a URL, 
with the difference that the information filled out by the user in the form gets tacked on somehow, either in the form of a post request or uh, in a normal GET request with all that information appended as GET parameters. GET parameters, if you remember, mean take a URL and then at the end you tack on a question mark followed by key value pairs, name value pairs separated by ampersands. Those are GET parameters. So here, for example, we have a form tag and in the form tag we specify the action, meaning the URL which the data is submitted to when the user hits the submit button and the method attribute specifies how we're going to send that data. Is this going to be a post or a get request? If it says post then the data is sent in the body of a post request to the URL which here is the relative URL page.html. The content of a form can be anything you like but the actual form elements, the things which have the data which we're going to send those are called inputs. So we have input tags, and for each input we specify what kind of input it is. Uh, text here means that it's a text box, checkbox means it's a checkbox, obviously, and type submit means that it's the submit button, which by default just has the text submit query, though you can customize that. It doesn't have to read submit query, you can have the button say something else. So the key thing to understand here is that the form tag itself is not really like a visual element. It's just a logical container for a set of inputs. And when you submit the form, all of the data entered into those inputs in the form are what gets sent. You might have a separate form on the same page, but those two forms are separate. The inputs in one have nothing to do with the other form. In any case, you can see in the example I've written, as the user of the web page, I've written hello, and if I were to click on the submit query button, then that would send a post request to the URL page.html, and the body of that post request would include two values. You would see Bob equals hello, and Carol equals blank, because I didn't check the checkbox. If I had checked the checkbox, it would have the default value Carol equals on. In any case, forms are the primary means by which data entered by the user on a web page can be sent to the web server. Finally, we have two last notable tags. There's the object element for embedding plugin elements, most notably flash elements. And then the iframe tag, I here standing for inline, as an inline frame refers to an element which itself is a separate HTML document, something which is requested as a separate document but then displayed as an element within some other page. The use of iframes is somewhat frowned upon. It's certainly something that can be easily abused. For example, iframes are what you see when you get pop-ups, but in a few contexts they are genuinely useful. 